Hello and welcome to The Rabid Atheist. I'm Ed Raby, a former pastor turned atheist, now a compassionate anti-atheist. Welcome to my channel. Like and share this video. Join the Rabid Nation, a nation of people dedicated to normalizing atheism and deconversion by hitting the subscribe button. And if you want to support the channel in a more tangible way, hit the join button and your membership options that lead to citizenship in the Rabid Nation will be presented to you. Uh, today would normally be a Friday video, but I had a little bit of an illness, so it's going to drop on Saturday. Um, I do apologize for that. I'll get into more of what's going on there uh, at the end of the video. So, but thank you all for your patience. Uh, but today, um, I've received this question several times over the last week. You know, what kind of pastor were you? And I always get puzzled by that question. Um, there's also ways that behind that question, I suppose you were never really a pastor. You know, they're kind of insinuating that you were never really a pastor. So for those of you that want your affidavits and want something to research, you know, to prove the rabid atheist Ed Ravy was a pastor, um, you can call the Assemblies of God Michigan District in Farmington Hills and ask if there's a guy who was ordained in 2001 by the name of Ed Ravy. You can also uh, call Hersey Congregational Church in Hersey, Michigan and you know leave a message for them because i don't have a secretary and did you have a pastor that was pastor there from 2008 till 2018 by the name of ed raby i'm sure they'll have stories and and depending on who gives you the response uh might be interesting they might be annoyed to be honest but you know whatever and a lot of you have questioned my educational creds from time to time um you know, just look up Trinity Bible College, class of 1993, and Asbury Theological Seminary, class of 1996, and my name should be in the roster. So, um, it's Edward Raby, Raby Sr., probably. Um, so, that out of the way, uh, let's get back to the question of what kind of pastor were you? Now, I get the insinuation behind the question, because there's a lot of people, it, it goes along with the same you know, question, what denomination were you? What kind of Christian were you? That a lot of atheists who used to be believers get, you know, because it's like, there's an insinuation behind the question that if you were the right Christianity, if you were the right type of Christian, if you were the right type of believer, or you had the real genuine walk with God, um, or you were the right kind of minister and pastor, that somehow you would never deconvert, that, that there's a, a true form of Christianity or a true form of being a minister or a true form of following God that would cause you to never want to ever leave the faith, okay? That there would be such this dynamic relationship sort of thing that would never pull you away from it. You know, and, you know, I'm just kind of freewheeling because it's a Friday, Friday slash Saturday video, I guess. Um, for me, I think that this just shows your own, shall I say it, um, you're just not totally comfortable with your own belief. You're not, uh, you're, you're trying to justify why you still believe, in a sense. And you're trying to say, okay, you know, I know that I believe. And, you know, if, if somebody believes, you know, they, they never would give this up. Why would they give this up? Why would you give up eternal life? Why would you give up all this stuff? And it's, the issue is, is that real? Okay, from my perspective as an atheist now, is all of that real or is it just something that people made up? And that's the, has been and continues to be the issue for me. And I look at it and I say, no, this is all made up. You know, it's made up from the word go. Uh, people have created this faith. And the reason why there are so many denominations and so many faiths is because it's not as crystal clear what real Christianity is. And that's, that's the problem. You know, a lot of people, you know, you have this bias that says, I found the real Christianity, so therefore I'd never fall away from it. And, and so if I see somebody else falling away from Christianity, well, they must not have the Christianity that I have. And the problem I've had now with that argument is that, you know, how do you, you know, how do you know that you have the right Christianity, first of all. What's your epistemology to let me know that that's the right form of Christianity? And two, I bet if I found your type of Christianity, I'd also find somebody that's deconverted from it. And I don't know of any form of religion or Christianity or anything that people haven't deconverted from. And so the whole issue of, of is your Christianity or your religion true comes down to 
if it's so doggone true that nobody would ever leave from it, then why do people leave from it? Okay, I'll bet I can find just about every cult and sect that's had people leave from it. Okay, if it's so doggone true, why do people leave? I mean, it seems like if you endow your faith, particularly Christians endow their faith with this, this absolute assurance that this is the right way to go, there would never be any doubts about it, okay, by anyone, not just yourself, but by anyone. The fact that other people doubt your faith or whatever indicates to me that there's some lostness, that maybe there's not so much absolute truth to that version of Christianity because people have doubts about it and they leave, correct? All right, well, then it comes to me. What kind of pastor with you? Well, that depends on the time frame, okay? Uh, when I first started out as a minister, I was a fundamentalist, Pentecostal, a Simmons of God boy, okay? And I believed that wholeheartedly. And when I went to Bible college, that's where I was. It's Bible college that began to actually put the cracks in that because I, did two, I took two classes, apologetics and life of Christ. And for the first time in my life, I looked at like the resurrection account side by side and suddenly realized there were two different, two different versions to the story. One where Jesus says, you know, go to Galilee and wait for me there. And the other one says, tarry in the city of Jerusalem. So which, which command did Jesus give? Okay, based on the different versions. And you have two different stories that follow from that. And there's an inconsistency there that I couldn't reconcile and still haven't been able to reconcile. And I don't think anybody that I've heard has ever reconciled it properly. Um, and then I also took apologetics and I started being the logical brained person that I was, I began to analyze the arguments for the existence of God and all that stuff and realized they were flawed. Um, but I had this genuine experiential faith, I thought. Okay, I, I couldn't see any way past, like many of you, I couldn't see past the, the experiential nature of faith. And I, I felt I had the true Pentecostal faith. You know, I felt, you know, the warming of my heart and I spoke in tongues and I was the true Pentecostal believer. And by the time I was done with Bible college, I had all these questions. That's why I went to seminary. was, okay, maybe the institutes of higher learning have, have better answers. But they didn't either. Okay, I took a class called Old Testament. And it's there I was introduced fully to the JEPD theory. And as a pastor, as a pastor in training at that point, I was still very much a fundamentalist, but I was realizing that fundamentalism and Pentecostalism and Christianity in general had their flaws, that it wasn't as ironclad as I thought. And that's where, you know, well, you got to have faith. You got to faith, have faith and believe. But then I began to ask the question, what is faith then? Okay. Now, I, I have lost track of the number of times I looked at Hebrews 11. That's why when I do the Bible study during the week on Hebrews 11, it's like I've looked at this so many times, it feels ridiculous to me. But at the same time, I, I get it, why people don't want to say that. So as a fledgling pastor in training, the edges on my fundamentalism as a pastor kind of started to come off. I was preaching this whole time. I started preaching when I was 16 years old in my church. And, you know, over time I became an itinerant preacher. I was preaching in different churches when they had a pastor gone. And I would go, and I was very fundamentalist, you know. And then I got my job as a Christian education director and then Christian education pastor in the late 90s. And... At that point, I was still pretty much a fundamentalist, but there was a lot of faith behind that and not a lot of reason or facts behind it, and I knew it. Okay, I knew that my form of Christianity had its flaws. I knew that a lot of forms of Christianity that I examined had their flaws. As a pastor, I was very committed to the idea of getting people in the truth. You know, I spent a lot of time as a Christian education pastor indoctrinating and you know, I was going to talk on indoctrination, a little precursor that I may talk about that next week, but I was in the process at this point of, okay, how do we get people to stay in the faith? And the one statistic that jumped out at us all the time is, well, if you get people when they're children and you teach them this their entire growing up life, they stick with it. That's the best chance of sticking with it. I wouldn't have used the term indoctrination at that time. I'd be like, okay, planting the seeds early is the best way to keep people in the faith. But I I began to ask a question, well, if it's so damn true, then why can't we plant the seed at any time and have people stay in the faith? And as a pastor, I was, my, my ministry ethics was changing as to how truth could be asserted, 
okay, and accept it. And I was spending a lot of time thinking about that. And it's probably what made me, when I finally did get my first church and my second church in the Assemblies of God, um, I just, the edges came off my fundamentalist. And I became more accepting, and I used to go to ministerial association meetings and dialogue with my fellow ministers that were in that area, uh, first in Greenville and then later in Perry. And I began to realize that there was a lot of different forms of Christianity. They were all flawed. They all had their problems. And the baseline of Christianity, you know, Jesus was horribly flawed too. And the edges of my fundamentalism, the edges of my belief in the inspiration of God being verbal inspiration were already gone. I was having some major troubles as an Assembly of God guy maintaining the 16 fundamental truths, particularly uh, the first one, you know, the Bible's inspired and, you know, verbally inspired. And I was also starting to have major league trouble uh, looking at the doctrine of tongues as the initial physical evidence. I was having other problems with eschatology, you know, the rapture of the church and the tribulation and the millennium and all that stuff. And, you know, the more I studied Revelation, the more I'm like, eh, I think this is first or second century stuff that they were jiving with and they were talking about their own times, not future. And the more I began to look at the different parts of the Bible and the more I taught the life of Christ over the years, the more I realized that there were so many inconsistencies even with that story, particularly in the birth narratives and the, particularly in the resurrection narratives. Um, as the resurrection became like, okay, we have a whole bunch of people telling stories and they don't all agree, but we're all going to accept it. And so I, I dumped that part. You know, when you really, people ask me what really killed my faith long term, studying the Bible, okay, and trying to rationalize it and make it make sense. It certainly wasn't the inspired word of God at a certain point in my ministry, probably in my last church, that it was like, okay, it can lead you to God, but it's not like a work of God itself. Um, and so I left the Assemblies of God because as a pastor I had changed. I was not the fundamentalist anymore. I was a Christian with this personal walk with God and feeling that all the revelations and stuff that led to that just opened up, you know, all the Bible really was to me was at that point was, okay, there's revelation from God here, but I got to find it. Uh, and a lot of you know, you know, my part of the story in deconverting, but I was probably became more moderate um, in my tone preaching, trying to get the good things out of the Bible, things like that. And of course, in, you know, I started my blog, All Things Rabid. And what that really was is I was writing like, this is what I'm discovering in the Bible, you know, kind of thing. It's my thoughts and ideas. And, you know, if you read that blog, it sounds like I'm a believer all the way through it. But in truth, I'm wrestling with every single thing I'm writing about. That's what I was wrestling about. And I did all kinds of topics like marriage in the Bible. I did, you know, um, nudity in the Bible. You know, does God really have this hardcore stance against nudity anymore? Did he ever... Uh, marriage, uh, I did hell, I did, you know, all the major doctrines that people have trouble with, I started to examine biblically and came to a lot of conclusions that I'm like, well, why are we so upset about this? The only thing I could find in the Bible, like for instance, marriage in the Bible is a good example of, of some of the discoveries you have if you just read the Bible and take it for what it says. One, polygamy, either way, is never forbidden. And that includes women marrying more than one man. It's not exampled in the scriptures, but there's no hardcore prohibition that a woman can't have more than hus one husband or that a husband can't have more than one wife. And so I began to realize that the only thing that the Bible really prohibits is bestiality and homosexuality. Those are the two things that it takes a hardcore stance against. And everything else is kind of negotiable. <laughs> and the moment I realized that the Bible didn't have as hard a stance on that. And when people come at me and say, oh, it does, it says, yes, I, I get that in the New Testament they go really mono is the, the ideal, but it also, you know, gives, you know, things for deacons and all those, that husband of one wife. Well, why would you have that standard unless polygamy wasn't a possibility? Okay, if they're, they're polygamists, they're disqualified from church leadership. Okay, fair enough. And that became a whole different issue. And the more I studied the Bible, the more I, it became a problem. A lot of people, oh, you must have, 
I got, I just got that this week. You know, you must have had some major crisis happen, and that's why you left your faith. And it's like, no. Uh, in 2015 and 2016, 2015 is the year I, I left Christianity. I realized Christianity could not be true. Um, and then 2016, I realized that belief in God didn't have any evidence for it. And uh, you know, I've said it. You know, I started. I had a sabbatical in June of 2016. I started in that month having a very pale and sickly belief in God. And by the time I was done, I didn't have any at all. And I spent the next two years in the pulpit, preaching of faith and believing in something, saying I believed in something that I didn't. That's why it became so st stressful for me. And the kind of pastor I became as an atheist was a little bit more just trying to focus on the compassionate side of helping people and helping people get with their problems and getting through things and stuff like that. And the funny thing is, as a pastor, I became less dogmatic over the years and became more compassionate, became more diplomatic, became more you know, understanding of people's doubts because I had them myself, and then at the end, I didn't have any faith at all. So what kind of pastor was I in that sense? I don't know. You can make your own conclusions of it. I think... From my perspective, I came to a very rational decision that Christianity could not be true. Okay, it has way too many flaws in it. And then later on, belief in God didn't have any evidence for it. That's me diligently studying the Bible over a, pretty much an eight, 20, you know, all my life from the time I was 16 until at that point when I realized, so what? And after that, the only time I studied the Bible is to get ready for a message. You know, what can I draw out of this that's positive? you know, away from all the the bullshit of what the Bible is. And I know people get offended when I say that, but sorry, the Bible is a lot of BS, okay? There's not a lot of truth to it, okay? Um, and so I began to, I began to realize that, you know, trying to help people is still something I do. It's why a lot of the aspects of this channel are still very, quote, unquote, pastoral, okay? I'm not trying to be your pastor, but I understand when you're going through something. And so that's the kind of pastor I was. I mean, if you want the labels, you know, I was a Pentecostal Assemblies God pastor, and later on I was a non-denominational congregationalist, not Pentecostal or charismatic-based. People hear that word non-denominational. In our case, it was just we weren't attached to anybody. We were a church on our own. Still are, I believe. And, you know, we, we just were, okay? And... Being congregational allowed me the freedom because our doctrinal statement was so wide open. It gave me the freedom to examine all these claims. And by the time I was seven years into it, eight years into it, I was having a lot of trouble with the claims of Christianity and with God in general. So as a pastor, I suppose I did change over the years. I, I know that in my last church, the highest compliment I got was you change the entire tenor of the church so that it's much more you know, accepting and much more, you know, we, they were always having a lot of infighting before I got there, and my diplomatic nature kind of calmed things down. And, I, you know, for me, that was the highest compliment I could have got. Unfortunately, that person who gave me that compliment died, and then that's what led to my whole crisis at the end there before I left. Um, I lost two good friends in a very short amount of space, and my family and my wife in particular weren't very helpful with that. And... Um, in a church too, but you have to be strong for everybody else, and nobody's strong for you anymore. That's one weakness of a pastor. And I didn't believe in God, so I wasn't talking to him. You know, I talked to an imaginary character you don't believe exists anymore. And so I was handling it on my own, and it wasn't going well. My autistic nervous system was overloaded, and I made a lot of bad decisions. <clears throat> and now those bad decisions are very understandable. And I now I'm. I do a lot of things to manage the stress and deal with the things, you know, to get better. But I was a Christian. I very much believed in God, and it was Christianity and studying the Bible and being looking at different doctrinal faiths from all different types of Christianity that led to my going, you know, if this was the absolute truth, there'd be a lot more assurance of it that wouldn't require faith. Um, and, you know... Other people do other things like, you know, science and actual gain data and going out there and they actually get results. And Christianity doesn't get results other than bad ones. And, you know, I just, I, I couldn't handle that anymore and so I left. 
So if you want to know what kind of pastor I was, I'm a very devoted one until I realized through the study of the scriptures that it was bullshit. I mean, 2015 and 2016 were really good years for me. Um, as far as stress, you know, it was a lot of good things were happening in my life. My, you know, my my kids were getting married, you know, during that time frame, including my son. It's funny, it's ironic, I suppose, the, the month that I lost my faith was the same month that my son got married. Um, and I remember, you know, I was doing the prayer at that, and I was thinking to myself, well, I'll say some nice things, <laughs> you know, but I really wasn't a believer anymore. So, um, you know, it just, uh, it was a long journey to becoming an atheist, okay? And it's because I wanted it to be true so badly. You know, I, I've spoken of this, the emotional attachment to wanting to see my father again, um, the emotional attachment, the sunk cost fallacy, was deep in my heart. Of, I've invested so much in this, it better be flipping true, you know. And, you know, here I am. Okay, what kind of pastor was I? I was a real Christian pastor with real Christian credentials, with real Christian education, and none of it. And I grew up in the church from the time I was four. I was indoctrinated in it, just like I did indoctrination as a Christian education pastor. And yet, I walked away. Now, there's either something horribly flawed with Christianity or something horribly flawed with me, and I'm going to go with Christianity. I don't think, I've got my flaws, but, you know, I'm not into all the, the bullshit anymore. I want something that I can put my hands on and know that works. I do know that since, you know, recent yearly discoveries of autism and hypersensitivity, I've been able to manage my stress a hell of a lot better although I'm having some problems, which I'll talk about in a minute. But, um, you know, that's the kind of pastor I was, a very compassionate one who loved his people, who cared about people. Um, couldn't always express it because of the autistic masking, and that got me into trouble more than once in my churches. Um, well, you just don't care. I got that a lot. Um, I did care, but I couldn't really express it, and that's not a good attribute for pastors to have. So that's kind of the way I was. But now I... I came to a rational understanding of Christianity being false and all of its versions being false because it's on a faulty premise, this idea that Jesus Christ was a historical figure. What you see in the Gospels is a possible nugget of historical truth that Jesus of Nazareth existed, but over time Christians added a whole bunch of legendary mythology to him. And that became crystal clear to me the more I studied the life of Christ with, with a discerning, you know, open mind, you know, looking at the different criticisms of it. And I began to realize that, you know, when you line things up, Jesus just becomes this big, growing mythological legend, a lot like Hercules and, you know, and other legendary figures get added to, and there's nothing new there. Uh, nothing new there at all. Uh, I think that's enough for that. Um, I'm sure I'll still get you theists out there saying, well, you weren't a very good pastor, and you weren't a very good Christian, and you had the wrong version of Christianity. That's your own insecurities talking, you know, that's how I kind of take that now, is if you were really securing your faith, you wouldn't have to, to yell about that. You'd be worried about more about how do I get this guy to come back to the real faith instead of challenging his faith and, you know, being insecure about mine, you know. Be a little bit, you know, quit being so insecure and asking me what kind of pastor or Christian I am and go forward. Um, moving on. Uh, yeah, I've been, I didn't put this video out on Friday because I was sick as a dog. I came home from work. At, uh, I work overnight, so I came home. I got home at about 8 o'clock in the morning. And my stomach was really upset. Didn't think too much about it. It happens every once in a while. But then next thing I know, I spent the next 24 hours pretty much either napping on my bed or, you know, standing over the toilet pretty much. And that's been pretty much been most of my weekend so far, except up to right about now, uh, where I actually am feeling a little bit better. Um, I did have a few moments in there where I was, I'd get up, I couldn't sleep anymore, so I'd play a little games or whatever and uh, do a little research, watched a couple of videos on autism and stomach ailments and suddenly realized that could be part of the problem. Um, the problem with being hypersensitive is your stomach is hypersensitive too. And it's my nose and my taste buds have been a part of that too. And anybody who knows about this, this is what makes socialization at like a dinner party or where there's a lot of food and stuff like that difficult for an autistic person because they pick up all the smells and 
sometimes your nervous system just gets overloaded with it and it just makes you awkward as hell. The real problem with hypersensitivity is that it can also lead to physical type reactions. And I think that's what I had. I had a, I ate something on, it may have been bad to begin with. I don't know. It didn't taste wrong to me, but when I look at, you know, it's like, by the time I was done, you know, everything I had eaten for lunch at like 2.30 in the morning, uh, my lunchtime, uh, had left my stomach. And there was no real, you know, rhyme or reason to it. It was just this kind of, and I, I tried to drink water with some flavoring in it, and it rejected the flavoring, <laughs> okay? It got rid of the flavoring, kept the water. Um, stomach just didn't want anything in it. Okay, and it's still kind of there. Uh, I'm going to try some stuff later, I, but I haven't eaten in probably 36, you know, hours. So I'm still, still kind of reeling from this. Uh, you know, I haven't eaten since 2:30 in the morning on on Friday. So um, still, and my stomach is still a little queasy. So it's like eh, I, don't, I don't know if I want to try it until it no longer feels queasy. So keep it hydrated, and that's about it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's another thing that I have to put in my brain, you know, what I eat, how often I eat, you know, being around food. That can cause a lot of stress. So even talking about it, you know, can be stressful. So thanks for all the, the well wishes. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I'm glad nobody said thoughts and prayers because I, I would have laughed and then probably cried. But okay. Um, but anyway, thanks. Uh, thanks once again for all the concern. Uh, as far as other things involving the channel, I I was going to put out a video today about Baja Khan and how I want to go, but I think I'll have to delay that a week uh, because of my illness. Uh, the big issue is financial, and you know I, I recently had to fix up my car with a, a major price tag to that, and some of the extra money I'd saved up for a lot of things just disappeared. So um, I'm okay. I make it. Bills are paid, except for one. It's a big one, but I, I can't pay it. I don't have the money for it, and uh, it's not critical. So, um, but that's kind of where I'm at with it, and you know, I'm I'm just moving along the best I can, trying to get to Baja Khan. I think I'm going to take the time off, whether I go to Baja Khan or not, uh, just to have a weekend and a week afterwards off from work. Uh, I've got time saved up, so I can do that. So. Um, but whether or not I go to Baja Khan greatly depends on the condition of my vehicle, which I now realize has a few things and being able to afford the ticket and, you know, get the room to stay. So that all has a price tag to it. And I'll talk more about that next week. Um, but, um, anything else going on? Oh, probably the few comments, you know, I did Father Casey this week and I always get, well, you don't really understand these arguments kind of goes along with the rest of the things that I've said today, you know, if you really understood this uh, arguments, you'd still believe in God. And it's like, no, I do understand the arguments and you know what, they're crap. And they're still crap. They were crap when I was in apologetics class and at TBC, I realized their flaws back then and they're still crap, <laughs> okay? And the fact that Christianity or believers in God haven't come up with anything new in literally probably a thousand years, uh, just as kind of telling, so they're crap. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of good feedback. Uh, coming up, I, I saw Skeptics and Scoundrels and Apologia get together on a video about the 10 Atheist Commandments, and that caught my attention, so that might be Monday's video where I react to uh, Mr. McDowell and his review of the 10 Atheist Commandments. I thought they did a good job, but to me, that's just something that I can react to and give my opinions on and kind of add to the discussion rather than steal anybody's thunder. So I might do that. And then, uh, you know, whatever will be on Thursday where we deal with the existence of God again. You know, is there anybody out there with the better arguments? Um, and then, uh, you know, the normal stuff this week, I'm, I'm the uh, Deconstructing Spiritual Disciplines series. It will end this week. It'll be my last episode on that on Wednesday. Hopefully, and then you know Thursday Bible studies will go on and on. So we'll see we'll see how that works. Uh, but other than that, it's just been it's been a normal week until I got sick, and uh, so I'm still a little queasy, still a little that. So uh, hopefully everybody will just hang in there until we get there. And so um, you know, thanks for your patience this this last couple of days. I appreciate it. Um, and, you know, as always, thanks for stopping by. Uh, like and share and do the things that you guys do. 
Um, and as always, live your best life. Don't uh, waste your time in the trappings of religion and faith, but take all your time, money, and opportunities and invest them into yourself, the relationships that you with people that you love and care for, and uh, you know, making this a better world. You'll be happier if you do. Trust me, I speak from experience. And as always, um, thanks for stopping by, and I'll catch you next time.